Okay. All right, we're all set. Okay. Hi, everybody. I am so glad that you are able to join us today. I'm Rachel Hirsch with Prestige Capital, and I am joined by my colleague and friend, Sally Ann Hughes. Um, Sally Ann is a founder of Hughes Kleiber. It's a boutique investment banking firm based in New York City that was founded in 2008. The firm helps entrepreneurs successfully sell their businesses from initial planning stages all the way to a successful exit. Clients are typically consumer products companies with a focus on personal care, beauty, and housewares. Um, so as most people who do know me, they know that I am a big networker and I go to a lot of networking events. So many years ago, Sally Ann and I met at a networking event. It was actually 12 years ago. Um, and <laughs> We, of course, have stayed in touch and, you know, cross paths over the years. Um, last year, you know, at the start of COVID, but even slightly before, I was doing so many consumer products deals, and I wanted to create a brain trust of trusted advisors for my consumer products clients because it takes a village to raise a business. And I figured that if I had good people around me that could advise my clients and prospects, it would make a much richer relationship. So I formed a group um, of dynamic women in consumer products and Sally Ann is in that group. Um, and what's great about the organization that I little put together a dog and pony show of clients and friends is that um, they tell you what you should join. One of the things that they told me that I should definitely be part of was cosmetic executive women. So Sally Ann and I are both on the advisory board. If you're a cosmetic business, I highly suggest you join this organization. Lots of great information there. Um, so in speaking and being on the advisory board, Sally Ann and I recognized that there was a need for, you know, good information about how to build a consumer products brand um, and how to put it in a position for an ultimate sale if that's your goal. Yeah. So here we I'm are. Webcasting uh, to somebody's but I, like if something's really urgent, I can do it, but somebody needs to be muted. Brandy, please mute everybody. Um, Sally Ann, can you tell us what's happening in the M&A market since COVID? Yeah, I will. Rachel, I can't believe that I've known you for so long. It's Time flies by. Um, oh, I'm going to give a little introduction to you just in oh, case there's yes. anybody on, on this call that, that doesn't know Rachel. <laughs> um, Rachel Hirsch is a sales director of North America for Prestige Capital. Prestige Capital is a commercial finance company that specializes in financing invoices for early stage and mid-stage companies. Rachel has over 20 years of experience in this industry and has worked with hundreds of companies from startups to high growth companies. She has championed their success and makes strategic introductions to help her clients grow and scale. And I can echo that. And um, you know, thank you for having me here today, Rachel, and, and for always being so generous and kind with your time and for being such a great networker. Thank um, you. And thank you to everyone who has joined today. It's nice to see some familiar faces and to meet some new people. And I also want to give a shout out to my Hughes Clyber colleagues who are on here today, which is Chris Hupp and Jake Beerley, and I think Julie Flackstad is joining as well. So thank you guys for joining. And um, okay, so you asked what is happening with, with M&A in um, oh, consumer good. products. Yeah. So, well, it's been kind of a, a, a bumpy and, and a crazy ride from, um, you know, 2019 was a really strong year for M&A. And when I say M&A, I mean both sales of companies and um, investments in, in uh, growing companies. But 2019 was really strong and things were really looking quite good in, in 2020 and in January and February, things were on track to be kind of on par with 2019. But you know, in March, all these deals that were underway came to a screeching halt, right? And um, a lot of deals were put on hold and, and a lot of things subsequently, you know, totally fell apart. And really there were no deals happening um, until the end of summer last year. Um, then what we started to see was that some larger private equity firms started to continue to acquire companies and they were acquiring things were relatively small in the grand scheme of how much money they have in, in their funds. So they weren't like risking everything, right? They were making what I would call small bets. 
And we also started to see some strategics jumping in and, and again, making things that were really good fit for them. Nobody was taking a big risk, but there were some acquisitions that where well, the valuations were actually quite strong, but they were like ideal strategic fits. Like Edgewell bought uh, a men's grooming brand called Cremo and they paid a, a great valuation about four times revenue, but it was a really good strategic fit. Um, and I think those types of deals kind of turned on the faucet and, um, you know, starting the end of last year and even, you know, first quarter this year, we've really seen things pick up dramatically. Um, you know, I, I, we, we pulled some data this morning and for deals that have happened through where we are today, we're, we're again, we're back on par with 2019, right? There is no COVID dip as of now. Things are back up and running. And just kind of anecdotally, I've never been at a time when we get so many inbound inquiries from buyers. You know, every day, you know, what do you have? What do you have for sale? This is what we're looking for. Um, so there is, you know, I think things have come back really quickly and positively, and there, there's a lot of buyer demand right now. And why do you think that it is that strong right now? Well, I think it was kind of like we have kind of like this perfect storm right now. We've got low interest rates, right? A lot of buyers who are already well-funded, who had, you know, money on their balance sheets pre-COVID. And, you know, that money has been sitting there and burning a hole in their pockets. And people are, are actively looking to make deals now. They want to make up for their last lost year. And especially consumer products has been one bright spot in the economy, right? Like people have been sitting at home buying things for their homes. And, you know, when it comes to wellness and beauty, a lot of those products were sold through channels that remained open throughout COVID. Right. Um, you know, an example, we sold a, a home fragrance brand in January and, um, you know, candle, sales of candles have, have gone through the roof during COVID. I mean, it has been a category that has grown astronomically. And the buyers for that company were in an adjacent housewares category that was also doing pretty well for them. So the buyers were confident. And then on top of that, they were able to get some really attractive financing in order to buy the company. So it was like just a really good fit. And the buyers felt very confident going into that opportunity despite COVID. Yeah, I'd say this year, you know, on the consumer product side, we had a client uh, that graduated a number of years ago who came back to us because they sell arts and crafts. And of course, if you're home with your kids, boy, you yeah. certainly need that. Um, we did a large deal that was outdoor plants because yep. everybody's sitting in their garden. I was speaking to a prospect yesterday that sells patio furniture and their sales are through the roof. And I can tell you that I am a huge consumer of candles and I definitely bought a yeah. lot of candles this year. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you're home, that's what's, you know, pleasing and it's not a lot you can do when you're trapped in the house. Yeah. So um, tell me, what other... are... sorry, go ahead, go ahead Rachel. So no. What are companies looking for when they're buying brands? Um, well, I think it depends on the buyer, right? For sure. If you are, um, you know, a big corporate strategic acquirer like the Unilevers, the L'Oreal's and the SD Lauders of the world, they are generally looking for brands that have a lot of upside growth potential, right? You think about those companies that have been, a lot of them have been around for a very long time and they have very big and slow growing or stagnant brands, right. brands that have stopped growing. And so they are in order to keep driving sales and keep their stock prices moving upwards, they need to find and invest in categories that are growing faster than their, you know, their, their base brands. So we've seen acquisitions, for example, a lot of men's grooming acquisitions. Cremo wasn't the only one. Things like clean deodorant and most recently a lot of vitamins and supplements. Those of you, you know, it's positive news for those of you, you know, in, in the supplement space. Um, because they're all fast growing categories. And the other thing that, um, you know, those big strategics are looking for are um, companies that have strong growth or strong future prospects in emerging markets, especially China. Right. Um, 
But then uh, aside from, you've got other buyers as well, right? Not just corporate strategics. And they're generally looking for big companies, right? They can't, they're not generally making smaller investments because it takes a lot to move the needle. Um, but private equity buyers have been very active and you know, private equity is always looking for companies that they can grow and then sell in a couple of years. I mean, it's, it's a flip model, right? Buy, buy a, a company and sell it. And the smaller private equity firms buy companies with the goal of selling them to the bigger private equity firms. And then the bigger private equity firms are buying companies because they know that they can, you know, move the things up the funnel and sell them to the, to the corporate, big corporate strategics. Um, so when a private equity firm is thinking about buying, they are the ones that are looking kind of like three, four years out in terms of what is going to be hot in, um, you know, three years from now. So what types of opportunities will the corporates and other buyers be looking for? And that's why we're seeing right now, for example, private equity firms looking at sustainable products or, you know, personalized beauty, for example. There's a, there's a lot of interest in those types of of products um, but there's another group of buyers too and they these is the biggest type of buyer especially for companies that are are not large it is other corporate acquirers and maybe they are they have 30 50 100 million dollars of revenue but they are looking to acquire smaller companies and and if you look at the volume of transactions that is kind of the biggest group of buyers that are out there and and they're looking for growth, but they're also then taking a look at your P&L and saying, okay, if I, if I take out this overhead and that overhead, what type of, you know, what type of opportunity do I have here? And, um, you know, what will the company look like when I have taken out certain expenses? And then another thing that those, those types of buyers are looking for is distribution channel fit. Right, so buyers that are strong in a particular channel usually want brands that they can expand or introduce into those same channels, right? So if you have a company that has great relationships with a, with a variety of target buyers, right? What are they gonna want to buy? They're gonna want to buy brands that maybe have a small relationship with Target or, or could be taken into Target because that's how they can grow a brand. Um, so we're always talking to buyers and kind of like you know, getting a feel for what people are looking for. And I, I think there are you know, three, three things that, three types of buyers that, that are looking for opportunities right now. So Sally Ann, is it important that a company be profitable or do they just need to be showing growth? in order to sell their business? Well, I think again, it depends on who the buyer is, right? Um, and what their tolerance is for, for driving additional, additional revenue in order to bring the company to profitability. Um, I think we've definitely seen more interest in profitability than you know, post COVID than pre COVID. Yeah, but you know what the number one thing that buyers are looking for is gross margins. With consumer products companies, buyers consistently are looking for companies that have strong gross margins, like fully loaded gross margins. If you have a brand that is selling and growing and has strong gross margins, right? You, it means you've got your products priced right, you're selling in the right channels, and you have good manufacturing relationships. So then a buyer looks at that and says, well, I can invest in marketing to drive up some revenue cut out some overhead and, and this looks like a really attractive opportunity for me. Um, and I, I, you know, everybody on, you know, so many people right now are having problems with the gross margin, right? Because of increases in, in freight costs and supply chain pressures. So, I mean, that's gonna be across the board, but that's still looking for good, strong gross margins. And um, if you have a strong gross margin company, I think you're a good candidate for an exit. But you still need growth, right? And, and sometimes that's hard to do without money. But I think, Rachel, that's a good transition back to you. Because I know Prestige has been around for a long time. And, and you know, I know that you have things that you can do to help companies drive this type of growth. Yeah. Um, you know, I've heard you speak a couple of times, and I know that you talk about Prestige being an ATM for invoices. Do you want to 
tell us a little bit more about what that means. Uh, I would love to tell you more about that. So um, interestingly enough, um, I come from a sales and marketing background. So I learned the value of, you know, the quick phrase and that's my quick phrase. Um, so Prestige is a 36 year old company. Um, I am with them for 14 years. So they call me the rookie because most people are there much longer. So we're a wonderful and strong team. Um, and we are an invoice discount finance company. And that's very different than what most people understand about, you know, accounts receivable, financing, factoring, so on and so on. And so the reason for the ATM machine um, as a visual is that we allow the client to literally, you know, do what they need, pick and choose, sell the invoice they need to draw out the cash when they need it. So the overview is, you know, if you have good receivables to credit worthy companies, um, I want to talk to you because the likelihood of me being able to grow your company quickly is very high. We typically work with companies between 2 million in annual sales up to 300 million in annual sales, which is a tremendous range. So we're talking to people who are literally creating a product at their kitchen table who now got an order um, up to companies that are, were acquired by investors and just need to keep driving growth and, and sales. And for us, we can onboard a client in a week. And closing a deal in a week is unheard of in any industry um, in the finance world. And the reason for that is we only need three things. I need to understand that I can have a first lien on your assets. I need to understand that your background personally is clean so that you have a good character and that you're selling to credit worthy companies. As opposed to most traditional you know, finance companies, we don't need financials, we don't need tax returns, we don't care how long you're in business, we don't take a personal guarantee. So it's really a good runway for cash if you are selling to credit worthy companies and need that liquidity you know, in order to grow your business. And um, you know, speaking to so many entrepreneurs in my 20 plus years in the industry, you know, some of them really go on to great success. And, you know, when you walk into the store and you see the product on the shelf that you championed, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. And advising companies and just working with entrepreneurs from, you know, their infancy till we fund them has been so rewarding. And I know Sally Ann, you share that with me, which is the interest in speaking to entrepreneurs. Even if it's too early, just be on each other's radar because things sometimes move so fast and you need to be ready when that happens. Thanks. So do you, Rachel, do you, on a one issue that comes up all the time, do you have to take all the receivables? If you're going to factor something, are you going to take everything? Or how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we have a lien on the assets, but they don't have to sell me all their invoices. So a company can be selling to 10 different clients, and maybe they only need to draw cash out of two of them to you solve whatever their problem is. So they would then sell us those two customers receivables and we only collect on those, we only touch those. And so as an entrepreneur, you know, you didn't get into business to have a finance company tell you what to do. You really don't want anybody telling you what to do. Um, and so working with us and having this flexibility is a real key driver in prestige capital success over 36 years is literally, you know, do what you need when you need it. We'll buy what you're selling if what you're selling me is good. And that is a great way for an entrepreneur to also get their feet wet. You know, you don't necessarily want to walk in with everything. You want to understand the process so you can sell a couple of customers and, and really get comfortable with the process and how that works. So it's been wonderful. Uh, so, well, I, you know, sometimes we are talking to companies and it's one thing to get, you know, to get the receivables, right? But sometimes you have an issue before you can actually get the receivables. Like what happens if you get a purchase order from a retailer or from like a subscription box and it's, you know, a big order, like you say, you're opening a, a whole bunch of doors for a retailer and you don't have the capital to pay the manufacturer. And right. especially what happens, you know, if your manufacturer is overseas, what, what happens in that type of situation? Yeah, so that's a great point. And I would say that when I speak to my referral partners and I do get a lot of referrals from bankers, I say, 
don't just call me when your client has invoice needs, call me when they get a purchase order and run to your desk saying what to do. Because purchase order financing can very often go hand in hand with invoice financing. And it's a partnership where you have two finance companies financing your company. The purchase order finance company does part A and we do part B. And the way it works is as following. I'll give an example. Let's just say you have a million dollar order from Target and it's gonna cost you $700,000 to make that product and you're making it overseas. And your overseas supplier says, I'm not releasing this product till I get paid. So we would vet your company and make sure you're a good fit for prestige. And then assuming so, we would pull in one of our purchase order finance partners. And if they approve of your factory and they've inspected the goods and everything is good, they will put up a letter of credit for that $700,000 to your supplier. When Prestige Capital buys the million dollar invoice, ultimately when it ships to Target, we pay back the purchase order finance company for the money that they have laid out for you, plus their fees. And then you get the difference of that in two tranches. And I'll explain that in a moment. So at the end of the day, you are utilizing other people's monies in order to fill an order. And I jokingly also call it transaction venture capital because you are filling orders using other people's money, but you're not giving up any equity. So you're paying a fee for what we do, granted, but we're not telling you how to run your business. And so working with a partner like Prestige who can pull in other partners like a purchase order finance partner is a great way to grow a business without giving up equity. Um, or, or giving away less equity, you know, depending on where you are in the game. Yeah. But, all right, so here's another situation, right? You just said that you need to lean on that, on that, you need to lean on the assets of the business, right? So sometimes people already have bank financing in place. Like a lot of clients that we work with have a line of credit, right? Maybe it's not a huge line, but they have a line of credit in place. So what can you can you use your services if you have already pulled down on the line? So that's a great question. And that's something we parse through all the time. So many of the deals that are brought to our table, they may have a line with a bank. If the line is small and wholly insufficient for your company's growth and your receivables are far greater than your loan amount, then it may be time to replace the financing of your bank with our financing. And what I mean by that is your bank lien doesn't allow me to come in and have a first lien. So if your receivables, let's just say, for example, are a million dollars and your loan is 250,000 and mm. your bank won't increase your line and then you're stimmied and you can't fill orders, guess what? I can buy those million dollars of receivables, pay off your bank, and then give you excess liquidity when I'm advancing on your AR and give you this complete runway for growth because there's no cap on what I'm buying. If you keep selling, I'm buying. A bank is lending money. So I jokingly say that bankers are historians and we're fortune tellers. They wanna know what have you done? Can you pay back a loan? I wanna know where are you going? Who's interested in you? Who's gonna, who's gonna buy your product? Yeah. And therefore, if I'm looking at, you know, what are your sales? What are your projections? What purchase orders do you have? Your bank is in the past, we're in the future. So that's one way is to literally just swipe out the bank, pay them off, get them out of the way so that together Prestige can help you grow. Um, but what oftentimes happens is that bankers will call us and they may say to us, listen, um, we have a great relationship with our client, but they just got a $5 million order from Costco and they want us to help fund it. And we don't do that. If we carve out Costco, from our oh. collateral pool and let Prestige have a first lien on that. On Will Costco. you come in and fund that invoice, fund the order, bring in a purchase order partner? And we have done that many, many times. So doing a carve out from the bank, it's a win-win because the bank keeps the loan, the client keeps the loan, but we strategically help them fill these orders. Mm. And that's been really important. Um, one of the things I wanted to go back and touch on is that when you do purchase order financing with a foreign supplier, um, we bring in a partner. But what if your supplier is domestic? Um, Prestige actually has a program which we call a factors assurance program. 
This is great for anybody who is using domestic suppliers. Essentially, it is prestige capital um, paying for your product to your supplier after you have invoiced the client and shipped the product and the client has received the product. So let's use an example. My client is shipping eyeshadow to Sephora. They're making it in California, right? The um, supplier doesn't really want to extend terms up until the point that Sephora is going to pay my client and my client's going to pay the, the supplier. So that manufacturer will actually get paid by Prestige Capital as soon as we buy the Sephora invoice, assuming that it was against that specific purchase order. So we're matching a purchase order that they made this eyeshadow for the specific order the order was you know, received by Sephora. And instead of me advancing money to my client, the first person I'm paying is their, is their manufacturer. Um, and the manufacturers love this program because they can really trust that there's a finance company behind the client. And the client may be an early stage company who doesn't have gravitas, but if you have a 36 year old finance company who's working with you, that gives you a lot of gravitas out there with your you know, suppliers. And we have done it so successfully that suppliers now send us clients. They love the fact that they're gonna get paid quickly, that they don't have to wait for their customer to get paid by a retailer. And so it just works really well. And so anybody on this uh, Zoom should understand that there is front end money. We just have to parse what's your particular need, um, but it is available. Thanks. So you're you kind of helping people jump step to the you know take take the company up to the next level. So yeah, do you you know do you see a lot of your clients who are who do exit? I mean, have you worked with companies that have grown from from baby stages up until you know an exit? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll I'll say that the baby word was a good one because one of them, <laughs> our client was an organic baby food company known as Happy Baby, which is now in every single store. Yeah. Um, and I have to say that when I walk into any store, including like the local little tiny independent grocery store, and I see that product on the shelf, I feel a lot of pride because um, we were introduced to them by their bank when the bank had that really small line of credit and the client said to the banker, like, this line of credit is not going to get us to the next step. What we want to do is sell to Whole Foods, but Whole Foods will pay in 45 days. We only have 15 day terms with our supplier. What do we do with that gap of time? And the banker who I've spoken to over the years said, you know what? I think that this line may not be your answer. I think prestige may be your answer. And um, you know, I engaged with the client and said, listen, not only will you not have to wait 45 days to get paid, if I buy your invoice right away and I fund it in 24 hours, you could pay your supplier quickly and maybe get a discount for paying early. Mm. And they grew with us in 12 months, about eightfold, okay? And within a year or two, they actually exited and sold their business for a big multiple. Um, yeah, they were Another client example, um, if anybody watches The Real Housewives of New York, would be Skinny Girl Margarita, um, also introduced by a bank um, and introduced because they were too early for bank financing. You know, a bank looks for two or three years in business, but when you are selling tremendously well and you don't have that history, a bank would love to bank you, but they can't lend money to you. So they introduced us, we financed them. They grew also so fast with us. It was like I said, a runway for cash. And we grew them and again, within a year or two, they sold the business for huge multiples. So again, you know, thinking of us as that unlimited cash flow, if you have good invoices and good orders, that's really what to keep in mind is that we can grow you quickly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no happy baby was sold to Damon, right? I believe so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Sally Ann, what should entrepreneurs be thinking of as they're building their companies if they know that they want to exit now or one day in the future? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's important to start thinking about an exit no matter where you are, even if you, you know, you're in the early startup phases or, or moving towards getting bigger. You know, thinking about an exit is so important. And I think that there's two kind of things that you need to do simultaneously is 
One is think about what do you need to do with the business to get it ready for sale? And then this, the other side is kind of what do you need to do to get yourself ready for the sale, right? Um, so with the first thing, get it, what do you need to do to get the business ready for sale? You know, think like a buyer, if you were coming in and buying this company, your company, what would you be looking for? Put yourself in the shoes of the buyer and think about doing some pre-due diligence on your own company that the buyer will be doing on your company. You know, you know, depending on the size of your company, if you're big, you're going to be getting a quality of earnings report. If you're small, you're going to be doing this yourself, right? And looking at the company and or in conjunction with, with your banker. But, you know, you need to think about things like, you know, take a look at your financials. Are they organized? Hopefully, you know, but not always. We see companies that, that really need to work on their financials. You know, are they 110% accurate? Um, if there are any indie brands that are listening that are kind of more in the startup phase, a piece of advice I have is find and invest in the best possible bookkeeper that you can have. You know, setting up your financials right from the very beginning is such a great investment. And Rachel said she doesn't care about financials, but a buyer is, and that can be a buyer and a bank, right? You know, banks and Buyers or investors are going to be scrutinizing your financials and it's better to get it set up from the beginning or fix it before you go into the exit process. And you know, think about the types of reports that a buyer is going to want to see. They're going to want to see you know, your sales by SKU. So if you're not tracking sales correctly through QuickBooks, you're going to have a problem with that kind of stuff. And you know, what is sales by retailer? And, uh, you know, do you understand your cost of acquisition per customer? Um, so think about what a buyer would want to know for your employees. Are they all motivated and performing? Do you have a good team in place? Um, do you have NDAs in place for your employees? What about, you know, another thing that buyers always ask about is intellectual property. And I've had this you know, put put a pause and, and make us all jump through hoops when, when a buyer finds out that you don't have trademark protection on some of your product names, right? I mean, we, I think we all immediately think about getting trademark protection on the company name, but you need it on your product names as well. And, and more importantly, make sure that you are not violating anybody else's trademarks with some of your product names. Um, Think about data. You know, what data do you have? If you're selling D to C, maybe you have, you know, direct customer data. But if not, you know, how do you, what do you know about your customers? How can you collect information on your customers so that you can show a buyer that you truly understand your customer base and what they're looking for? And that you have a way in which you'll be able to continue to grow sales through understanding the customer. So and there's, there's other checklists and a long list of things that you can start to think about with the business in terms of saying, okay, I need to check this, this, and this. But the other, you know, often overlooked part is, you know, getting yourself ready for an exit as, as the founder of a brand. Um, you know, I just said, think like a buyer. I think when you are thinking about yourself, you need to think like a private equity firm. A private equity buyers, buy companies, they run them and they sell them for a profit and they know exactly what type of return they're going to be getting. So, you know, think about it for yourself. What is a reasonable return that you would expect from the time and the money that you have invested in your own company? So understand your goals and priorities and kind of, you know, on an emotional level, can you sell this company that you've, you've built? You know, sometimes people, um, you know, people talk about their company being their baby. And I'm like, it's not a baby. It's a cash flow. You know, it's, it's <laughs> you're not selling your child. You're selling a growth opportunity to a buyer. But you got to think about that. And you got to be emotionally ready for that. And, you know, know what you want to do with a buyer. Do you want to exit off to the Caribbean? Or do you want to, you know, stay along for the ride and, and potentially, you know, recoup some additional some additional opportunity in the future. Yeah. But I also think, you know, this is one thing that we get a lot of people that call and say, well, 
I'm thinking about selling my company, maybe, you know, maybe two years or three years, we'll see what happens. And I, I don't think that's the best way to approach it. I think the best way to set is to set some goals for yourself in terms of, I am planning to build this company to X million dollars in sales, or, um, you know, whether it's 5 million or 10 million or hundred million dollars in sales, understand what it will take for you to get there and what type of, of exit you can expect and, and can you get there? And sometimes, you know, bigger, a bigger exit is not always better because there's, there's risk associated with growing the company. And you may have to, you know, at some point take on equity capital, right? And you get diluted. So just because it's a bigger check doesn't mean that you as the founder are necessarily gonna be keeping that check in your own pocket. Um, and the other thing to know is kind of like, know who the buyers are that are gonna be buying your company. You know, who is gonna be most interested in your company specifically and keep tabs on what else they're buying and, and kind of understand what they're paying and why you think they might be buying a particular company and, and try and find that out and, and figure out how that could impact your company. Yeah. And then I would say the last thing is, you know, understand the M&A process, right? You gotta understand what it actually takes to sell a company and what the steps are and you know know who is in a good position to help you as an investment banker and an attorney and an accountant um, you know educate yourself on that process and and know the market and but be flexible and ready to go when the time is right um, you know we we spend a lot of time speaking with, with company owners and we're always happy to go through this and speak one-on-one -on -one and help clients and prospective clients understand whether or not they have a saleable company and if not, why not? And how they can go about, you know, perhaps pulling some levers to increase valuation. Yeah, yeah. And I would say that we have a lot of takeaways of prestige. I would say that you're, um, your comment about a good bookkeeper, oh my God, 100%. Because if you yeah. come in our door and you don't understand, if your books are not in order and you don't know what you've invoiced and you don't know what you've collected yeah. and all of that, that's a nightmare. Because I could fund your invoices, but if you don't understand your books, that's hard, okay? Um, that's number one. Number two, you better read the fine print on your purchase orders. Um, so many people do not know what they just got into. They're just so happy to get an order that they don't yeah. read the fine print. Yeah. Comes back to bite them big time. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that you know is really important about partnering with a company like Prestige is, listen, in 36 years, we have funded every kind of client, every industry. But in the CPG industry, you know, we know the retailers. We know what kind of you know stuff they may stick in a purchase order that is going to be caged in words you may not understand, but we will understand. And we're going to say to you, you know, you should go back and ask about this clause. And, you know, for example, we just had a deal where um, the, um, the, the retailer took a huge deduction for end caps. The client didn't show us that page. Okay, that was not good. <laughs> so we need to see all the paperwork. We need to help the client parse through what exactly is happening and understanding it. You know, showing um, a finance company like Prestige that you have gotten paid in the past from a particular retailer is truly helpful so that we know that, you know, you've sold and gotten paid. It doesn't mean we won't onboard you if you didn't, but if you do, that's really, you know, great icing on the cake that makes us onboard you and, and feel comfortable with you. The other thing to understand about Prestige is we are a very unusual finance company because we're privately owned. We're not owned by a bank. Um, we make decisions on our own and we decide what looks like a deal that we're interested in. And we really take the client under our wings. And so if they need guidance, they need to meet a trusted advisor like yourself, Sally Ann. They need a new banker. They need a new attorney. They need an IP attorney. I make tons of introductions to IP attorneys. <laughs> and also, obviously, to our partners that fund the other assets and things like that. But we also introduce clients to one another because if, you know, one client is selling to one subscription box like FabFitFun and the other one is selling to um, BoxyCharm, which is now Ipsy, 
guess what? If you're in the similar industries, probably the buyer is the same or your buyer can find the right buyer. And I introduced two clients and now they're in both boxes rather than just being in one box. And so we do a lot in the subscription box space um, because years ago I got a referral from um, a bank to a company that was selling skincare and they said they had an order from FabFitFun and we looked into them and you know, we started getting more information on their financial well wherewithal so that we could buy that. And now FabFitFun sends us deals directly. Um, Ipsy sends us deals directly because they have product that has to go in the box. And if that company doesn't have financing, guess what? We're financing it. Um, and that's a great partnership. So we're very interested in partnerships and our partner channel is very strong. And introducing people within that network is really, I think, what differentiates Prestige. Um, we do a lot of social media. Brandy helps us with that. And we put out you know, um, press releases, but we also put out our clients' testimonials. And by seeing a company that looks like you, having gotten there already with Prestige, it should give you comfort. You know, We funded a client who was a FabFitFun client, um, the Vertical Collective, and they, during the pandemic, got an order from the state of California for $30 million worth of masks. And they called us as their partner and said, what do I do? How do we fill this? And we helped them arrange the whole supply chain finance and they filled the order. So Prestige can do these huge chunky deals. We can do one-off deals, but we can also work you know, with the early stage person who's growing in incremental um, numbers. So everything in there is a prestige capital deal. There's no one thing that, you know, oh, you have to only be selling to this kind of retailer. You only have to be um, doing this volume. Like I said, 2 million in annual sales to 300 million in annual sales is a tremendous range, but I'm happy to talk to anybody in that range um, because I've grown little tiny companies to very big companies. And I've worked with big companies to get them ready to exit and everything in between. So we're comfortable with all of it. Um, um, yes, I, I, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I mean, I, you know, it's not, it is not easy these days to build a consumer products brand, right? It is, a, it is increasingly challenging and increasingly more and more competition all the time. And, you know, increasingly challenging to deal with big retailers and increasingly challenging to, you know, build D to C um, acquisition strategies. But I think the key is, is to educate yourself on everything and, and to get as much information as you can from, from as many people as possible. Absolutely. And I know that all of my partners are always very gracious and happy to talk to early stage companies. I see my friend Mark Federbush is on here. He's a, an accountant who runs the consumer products at Anshin. Um, and he's happy to talk to early stage companies. And so, you know, use the advisors that we all have in our networks. Um, we're always happy to make introductions. And, you know, I always say it takes a village to build a successful business. So I think this may be a good place to come full circle. Um, I think there's been a few questions in the chat already. Um, Brandy, can you um, go through some of the questions? Yes. So one of the questions that we have, what multiples are you seeing in valuations in this space? It wasn't specific to anybody, but either of you two could respond. I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it depends, right? There's no such thing as one multiple. It totally depends on the size of the company, the growth opportunity of the company, the, you know, where you are with margins, I mentioned earlier, you know, upside for a big hundred million dollar brand is four times revenue, right? But if you're a you're a five million dollar company that's going to sell to a thirty million dollar company, you're not getting four times revenue because it doesn't make sense for the buyer. The buyer cannot buy your company and make you profitable when they have to pay that much money to you. So, you know, you should. I, I can't really throw out a number, right? Because it has to work for the buyer. You think about what a buyer pays you and then the return that they get on that investment, buyers are looking for the return as well. And the numbers have to work. Um, I would say, you know, valuations are strong because there's buyer demand. 
but it is always going to depend on your company and on the upside of your particular brand. So sorry, I can't be more specific to, to the person that answered that question, but it, it you know, it's, it's a, it depends question. Got it. And another question. Uh, what have you heard about Amazon it's aggregation aggregators as buyers like um, Trazio and what are they buying and are they limited only to Amazon distribution? Um, that's a really good question. And that is, you know, I mentioned earlier that we're getting lots of calls and these um, platform aggregators, there's a lot of companies that are looking to buy companies that are D2C or selling on Amazon and use it as a platform and acquire multiple companies. Thrasio has acquired over a hundred companies to date um, and they are actively out looking. They raised a humongous amount of money to make acquisitions and they're looking at smaller opportunities. But uh, along with them, we've had probably like seven or eight big, very well-funded companies that are jumping into the space to look at those same type of opportunities. Um, so, you know, they're primarily looking at Amazon, but we're seeing more and more companies that are looking at D2C companies, either D2C or Amazon or D2C and Amazon. If you are selling direct to consumer or you're selling through Amazon, you are likely gonna get calls from some of these people to say, hey, are you interested in exiting? And I think the key is to, you know, understand and, and talk to all of those people. Don't just jump in and, and, you know, exit to one because there's a lot of them out there and they're all looking to buy. All right. And we have one more question. If anybody else still has a question, feel free to drop it in the chat. But the last one that we have now is what is considered strong in GM? For gross margins? Yes. Um, I think it depends, again, by the category, right? And you got to be careful that you're putting all of your costs that are variable costs in gross margin, right? Sometimes we see people's P&L and they're like, hey, I have a great, I've got fabulous gross margins. I'm like, well, okay, your, um, you know, your freight is included in your expense line. So your gross margins are not actually as good as you think they are because you haven't included all of the appropriate line items in cost of goods. Um, but what you're going to see is that in most, for things that are consumable, right, like skincare or hair care, I think you need to be looking at 60%, you know, gross margins because the cost of selling is, um, is expensive. Um, but if you were looking at things like tools or housewares, I mean, it's impossible to get to those gross margins. You're, you're gonna be lower. So again, it depends on, on what category you're in and, and benchmarking against other people. Just right. make sure that you have everything in your, in your cost of goods that should be in there. Okay. okay. How do you think inflation, real or perceived, will impact the consumer product space? Rachel? I don't know the answer to this. Do you, Sally Ann? Um, well, I mean, I guess what, what is the impact going to be on, on consumer purchase behavior? You know, if, if, you know, if consumers see prices going up, how will they, will they change their purchase behavior? I, I don't know. I, mean, I think it's a concern, right? Will, Will, we're seeing great consumer demand right now. Will that soften if prices go up? And, you know, I think we are going to see inflation in the consumer product space because of what I talked about before with things like, you know, supply chain prices going up and freight costs going up. What is everybody going to do? They're going to have to pass those prices along to the consumer because they just can't keep um, absorbing those costs. So I think that we will see some, but I think it's going to be a balance in terms of how do you, how do you manage the pricing compared to the demand? Okay. Uh, so for direct to consumer businesses, do you include variable costs like shipping to consumer and direct to consumer shipping materials and cost of goods or opt EX? It should be in your cost of goods. 
if it's if it's a variable cost that you are incurring based upon that particular sale, it should be on cost of goods. Okay. Does anybody have any more questions? If not, then we will um, stop the recording. And if you're able to stick around, please do so. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. It was great chatting today, Sally Ann. Okay, Brandy, you'll stop the recording. Can you make me a co-host again, Rachel, please? Oh, did you get dropped out? I, I can pause that, hold on. Uh, I think Brandy will be able to stop. Do you want me to stop it? Sure.